good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Asima Sinha. I teach in the Gov Department and the IR program as well as the PP program. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Mukulika Banerjee here. Um, I've always wanted to invite her because I read her work uh, and she does fascinating work. She is an associate professor at London School of Economics. And her recent monograph on which she will speak is at the inter works at the intersection of political analysis and anthropology. Uh, and so that she studies elections, but from a rare micro and social perspective. So she has a new monograph, uh, which was published in October 2021, Cultivating Democracy, Politics and Citizenship in Agrarian India. Um, and I'm really looking forward to her, uh, you know, her talk on that book. Uh, in addition to that book, she actually has a lot of wide-ranging interest at the intersection of politics and anthropology. Uh, she uh, edited and has written a book called Why India Votes, which is again, she's interested in why people vote at all uh, uh, and, uh, and you know, going beyond just who they vote for. Um, her earlier work was actually on a front, you know, a province in Pakistan that what is, and where um, a Pakhtun movement, a non-violent Pakhtun movement originated uh, in 1920s and 30s. And that was her earlier work. So she kind of really spans different disciplinary strengths, uh, history, sociology, and po uh, politics and anthropology. Uh, so I think the, what is common in her interest is this focus on the interconnections between the social and political. Uh, she's actually written a book on saris, the Indian saris, and why uh, saris are still used and, and still, uh, you know, m m many women uh, wear them. Uh, and so um, she won't talk about it now, right now, but I'm looking forward to talking to her about it later today. So overall, she is, you know, she's got very wide ranging and interesting in interest. And I invite her to come and tell us about her new book. Thank you, Asima, uh, for the invitation to be here. And thank you to you all for uh, coming along. And thank you to people who put this uh, event together, coming from other universities. You discover practices like this, and it makes you envious. What a wonderful program this is. Um, and you're all very lucky to be, to be here. Uh, I'm going to try and make it worth your while to, to eat and listen, which is not always the easiest thing to do. And um, it's, uh, is there a clock somewhere? No, so okay. So I'm going to try and finish just before one o'clock so we have time for questions, which I'm really keen on. Uh, and you can ask me about anything. Asima set me up as a person with wide ranging interests. If you, if you want to completely ignore my talk and ask me about why Indian women continue to wear the sari and call themselves modern, that's fine too. Um, <clears throat> but we can talk about anything. Um, I am a political anthropologist, and, and this is really, this book is the one that Asima has just mentioned. This is the new book. Um, and it is a, a, a political anthropologist studying democracy. And it's a conversation that I've had with political scientists, political theorists uh, for over 20 years. And my conversations with Asima and huge admiration for her own work has been part of that uh, conversation. So I wanted to start with uh, the, my initial question. I thought I would take you through how I arrived at, at producing a book like this, Cultivation, Demo uh, Cultivating Democracy, and the previous book that Asima mentioned, Why India Votes, and how a political anthropologist studies Indian democracy, right? or indeed any democracy as a result by extension. Now, if you, my first, it, curiosity about Indian democracy was really triggered by a national survey that showed us this remarkable trend. This was in the late 90s, uh, at the turn of the century, where they showed us that Indians vote in very high numbers in every election, and that in every election it goes up. 
voter turnouts going up, which is a very different problem to, or different phenomenon to what we get in Euro America, for instance, where voter apathy is such, a, uh, such an issue. I wanted to present a map of India like this because this is what it looks like for those of us who think about elections and Indian democracy. This is the parliamentary constituencies, 543. India actually has less parliamentary constituencies than, say, Great Britain, which is a fraction of the size of India. So every parliamentary constituency is about 20 times the size of a British parliamentary constituency. And this has consequences for how politics is done. But that's another question we can talk about later. This survey revealed for us that uh, the turnout was above 66% and rising. The other way in which Indian elections and voters bucked the global trend was that turnout went up as uh, uh, local, at the further down you went in democracy. So local elections had more turnout than national elections. More women voted than men in some parts in those days, but now across the country, more women vote than men. And this has been a steady rise. So definitely, suddenly, women voters uh, can not only not be ignored, political parties are having to take them very seriously as potential uh, um, supporters. The size of the electorate has goes up constantly, but this was just to give you a sense of the scale of how large it is. The number of polling stations or polling booths is always over well over a million. But my research question was, having seen these broad trends that a survey showed, my question was, you know, to put it impolitely, why the hell are they voting? You know, why, what are people expecting? Why are people voting in such large numbers? And especially, why are the socially disadvantaged groups voting even more than um, than people at top of the pile. So really to answer, when I said this to the political scientists who had produced this survey, when I said, why is this happening? They said, we can't ask, you know, surveys don't ask why questions. They can show you what's happening, but we really need an ethnographer to go into the field and tell us. So you have to choose a field site. And I chose West Bengal because I had the language. I had never lived there, which is, helps with a certain distancing. But I spoke and read Bengali. Uh, and Bengal has had a very interesting political story. Um, and so I went about looking for a village that um, displayed the trends that I was interested in, i.e., I wanted high voter turnouts that were going up. And I wanted high rates of illiteracy and social disadvantage. So I visited all the 20 sites that had been picked up in the ram random sample of the National Election Study, and I chose one of those villages. And it was brilliant because this one particular site had, you see this road in the middle. There was one village on one side and the other one on the other side. So by going to this one place, I could study both these villages. And, I could, and when I say study, you will see what I mean in a minute. So I call these two villages Madanpur and Chishti. And this is what they look like. I don't know whether you've been to Indian villages, and even if you have been to, how many of you have been to an Indian village? Wow, OK, that's a pretty high number. That's more than half the gathering here. And if you've been to an Indian village, I'm always shocked at how impoverished my research site looks compared to a lot more prosperous villages uh, that other people seem to study, but this is uh, the composition of this village is mostly Muslim and a couple of uh, scheduled caste tribes as well. So this is what Madanpur looks like. This is what Chishti looks like. And the idea then was that if I am responding to the political scientists' plea that you need ethnography to find out why people are voting and, think, and what they think about the democratic process, then what can ethnography offer? Their expectations and my offering was this long-term engagement in a research site. So I first went to these villages in 1998 and have continued to do so ever since. So the book itself, for instance, the monograph that's just out, covers a 15-year period from 1998 to 2013. Uh, so it is a continuous study of that. Obviously, I'm not there all the time, um, but I have a day job but I go there every year. In this 15 year, in this period of, of time, 
There were over nine elections at all three tiers of democracy. And what ethnography is very good at picking up, which almost no other social science does, is that we don't only walk around with a clipboard asking people questions. We don't always ask. We also watch. That's what anthropology does. We're looking at what people are doing, also talking to them, but often with all of us, right? You say it's like, um, you know, we all make claims in our statements which are not at all, ma do not match our actions. So if somebody said to you, how do you get to campus? And you said, I always walk. And then you watch them and, you know, they drive two days a week. <laughs> but if you take them on, their, on face value of what they said, it's not because we lie. It's because, you know, we think we should say a certain thing or we believe that we really do walk. But so what if I drive a couple of times? And this understanding of how we all behave is actually quite key to ethnography. So a lot of the time, anthropology involves not talking, just being there, just becoming part of the furniture or being invisible in that society to just see what is going on, how people do things. Because, and then the, the next thing about ethnography is that we're also aware that even if you studied only elections, and I wasn't studying only elections, it's a broader project on democracy, that there is a recognition, which is a fairly obvious thing, but remarkably it's missing in a lot of analysis of elections, is that the voter on election day is a person in the round. A voter may be a farmer, she may be a pious person, she may be a mother, she may uh, like mangoes. I mean, there are all kinds of things that go into building up political subjectivity. And therefore, to really understand motivation, you need to understand and see people in the round. So paying attention to economic and social life becomes absolutely critical. In my case, these villages that I landed up in, having visited all the 20 sites, et cetera, was a very agrarian setting. They were growing uh, two crops of paddy a year plus one of wheat. When I started, the water table has dropped since then. But it is overwhelmingly, it is dominated by uh, uh, cultivation. And I'll return to this later. Now, this, the book itself covers three broad changes that occur in these 15-year periods. One is the transition, the political story, the electoral story, which is a transition between uh, the left front, which is a coalition of communist parties led by the Communist Party of India Marxist, CPIM, um, and it's, it's uh, reign for 34 years, so it's the longest uh, democratically elected communist government anywhere in the world. And in 2011, they finally lose the uh, uh, elections uh, after 34 years to a relatively new political party uh, set up in 1998 called Trinamool Congress. And that's the, all political parties in India have election symbols. I mean, all political parties have symbols all over the world, but in this largely visible, visual, illiterate, vast constituencies, the use of political symbols is absolutely critical. Um, so uh, people refer to political parties by their symbols. So Trinamool is, is the one on the right. So Trinamool literally means grassroots, flowers that grow in, in the grassroots. So the second big change that occurred was this change from um, a very relaxed kind of South Asian Islam, which was syncretic and uh, so, uh, you know, uh, all centered around the worship of uh, saints, uh, where there were shrines and graves of peers and, and holy men on the landscape in a very distinctly South Asian way giving way to a much more austere reformist Islam. It's a trend we are seeing all over the world, and they were not exempt. The way they were referred to in India, were, there were different names, but essentially that's what was happening. And there the big change, I think, for our understanding of democratic practice, the way I build up the argument, is that you, from more communal worship, there was a much greater emphasis on uh, personal practice, on personal piety and personal uh, devotion and saying your prayers five times a day 
being part, dressing yourself in a particular way and so on. So this was a big change that I observed during the time that I was there. And in the economy and in cultivation, the agrarian economy in particular, this was notable because, um, as I said, when, we st when I started fieldwork, it was very uh, green and uh, fertile, and the water table, because one of the paddy crops was the high-yielding variety. So this was the green revolution in India, which has gradually turned brown all over the country because they're such thirsty crops they, um, the water table just dropped and now cultivation becomes quite hard and expensive because you have to use diesel fire pumps that pull up the water from lower and deeper to deeper levels. So you spend a lot of fuel. It's just complete disaster is the story. But people are still cultivating because that is the main um, uh, agrarian, uh, main economic basis for, uh, for this setting. From the first set of uh, field notes and, you know, after the first few six or seven years of field work, I published, therefore, uh, uh, the first possible, and Asima, I know, teaches with this uh, article, this article which I called Sacred Elections, where my first explanation that my political scientist colleagues had, had uh, challenged me to find was why people are voting was that elections in India are a sacrosanct ritual, which is not to say that they're religious, but that they are something that you have an inviolate commitment to doing. You don't think, am I going to vote or not? You just do it. There are some things in life that you just do, and uh, going to vote was one of them. And if you're at the bottom of the social hierarchy, you definitely feel that commitment. And the reasons for it, I will explain in a minute, but this, uh, and I you know, wrote this article and I said why I think these have this sacrosanct status, and people seem to be persuaded, but people who knew Indian politics, who knew Indian society, were very much persuaded by the argument. But the pushback was, well, this may be true of your village, but how do we know, you know, it's anthropology's eternal problem, representativeness. And they said, how, is the, how do we know if this is true elsewhere in India? So we took this initial, uh, theory as a hypothesis and tested it across India. So these are the 12 field sites across India, sampled with some care uh, to cover as wide a range of societies as we could get. And we posed it as a question, are elections sacrosanct? And we had a number of ways in which. So as you can see, we started with an all India finding that voter turnouts are high and rising to understand why this was the case, I had to zoom right into a village and immerse myself in village life. Having made the first set of conclusions, I had to then, in order to make it an all India argument to test it, if this was true for India, I had to zoom out. This is the bit that anthropologists almost never do. Right? We, we are very content to stay with our micro site and say very profound things from there, but we don't test it because this required setting up a sort of comparative ethnographic project across India. So I was working with other anthropologists or ethnographers to, uh, to test what I wanted them to test rather than um, their own projects. So they were simultaneously and, uh, simultaneous and comparative during the 2009 elections. And we came up with, so this was the book, Why India Votes, that came out of it, uh, was the result of that study. And our conclusions was that exactly as I found in Bengal, there was a lot of money, there was a lot of muscle, there was a lot of bullying, there was a lot of violence during Indian elections, but there was also this completely unexplored and under-theorized aspect of elections, which was that going to vote itself was a very meaningful act for people. This is something nobody actually had been talking about, that the experience of going to a polling station was meaningful, and so, Elections were sacrosanct to anyone who could vote. So anyone, if you could vote, you did do it. Because if, especially if you are at the bottom of the social hierarchy, it was the only moment in your life in India that you experienced what political equality, which is enshrined in the Constitution, actually felt like. 
because it's the only moment in Indian life, only place in public where people are treated equally. So it didn't, in a, and it's orderly, it's civil. So it's the only place, how many of you have been to India? Okay, so again, a fair few of you. And you will know that it is such a socially stratified society that there is no other instance in which, for instance, uh, you know, the woman who, say, comes to clean your house is in the queue in front of you at a polling station. You go to vote and you see the woman who comes to clean. Your house is standing in front of you in the queue. It's the only time in India where you can't say to her, go to the back. I'm here, I'm your boss. You know, give me your space. I, want to, I don't want to wait. You will not ask because you can't, because you know that one day it doesn't matter who you are, how much wealth you have. You are an Indian citizen, she's an Indian citizen. And if you were to ask, it's the only instance where she'll say no. She, I mean, there's no contest. And sometimes, and I know this because film stars, one film star, one tries to do this in Andhra, it made the headlines the next day. What did he think he was doing? How bizarre. So this, the fact that it's such a big deal and we make nothing of it, and I, you know, I want to persuade more and more people to think about this seriously. So it brings dignity in a way that, uh, that is unprecedented and unmatched by any other action. And across the country, when we set up this experiment for Why India Votes, we had no idea what we were going to find. We, you know, we were completely open to the possibility that this was something that was unique to my village, that people felt this. But field site after field site, informant after informant, this was our finding, that this was indeed the case. And that's why. People said, you know, if you said to them, why do you vote? They said, why wouldn't you vote? It's great. I feel super when I go to vote and I come out feeling I walk taller. You know, a young Dalit girl said, she said, you know, the whole village was looking at me differently after I came out to vote because I was suddenly being taken seriously and so on and so forth. There's lots more in the book for anyone who wants to uh, read it. But then I had to zoom back, right, because I'm an anthropologist. And it's not just the fact that I, we work at a village at a uh, level. There were two things going on. One is that it's only at that very finite level of a village that, um, and if you, uh, sorry to have put up the slide and distracted you, uh, just let me say a couple of things about the village and then I'll talk you through the slide. Um, the village is small enough for you to know everyone and for you to have been there long enough to be part of the furniture and to be watching what is going on. So there is real immersion right, and long-term engagement. The second thing, which is much less, again, talked about, is that the book, Cultivating Democracy, is not a book about village politics. I mean, why would I, why would I expect anyone else to be interested in what's happening in the village? You know, it's entertaining, but beyond that, it doesn't teach you anything. You're writing not about the village, but from the village. You're thinking about ideas about democracy from the perspective of a village where you have insight from long-term immersion. And what I'm going to tell you for the next 10 minutes is really a result of that immersion and that uh, thinking. So if you were to now look at the slides, well, one thing we know, of course, is that Democracy is not just about elections. It's also what happens in between elections. And again, I'm staggered by social scientists who go to study things only when they're happening, as if you know, that village that has just finished voting for this party or that party continues to exist as a village after the elections are over. What happens then? Because what happens in between elections is going to determine what happens at the next election. So unless you study both those temporalities, it seems to me meaningless. And that's what I was doing with being there during elections. I was always there for the elections, but I was also there when there was a harvest, when there was a wedding, when there was a festival, and there were other stuff going on. And so to my mind, that first thing that you, know, you have to think about uh, democracy as a combination of institutional forms as well as cultural forms 
there's democratic culture, and there's institutional democracy. And institutional democracy in this case has been captured by our study of elections, which is the most prominent institutional form in a community. There are others. Um, but I also wanted to examine democratic culture and what kind of transformation democracy was achieving in, uh, in between elections. So the important questions really were drawn very much from the Indian Constitution, where, as I say here, that this distinction between the democracy and the republic is, uh, is the result of reading you know, the constitutional debates and what was going on when, when that literature was, uh, when that constitution was being finalized. And the, the decision to call India a sovereign democratic republic. Now, this was very much Ambedkar's doing. Ambedkar, who chaired the drafting committee of the Indian constitution, a Dalit himself, an ex-untouchable, uh, a towering intellectual and, and figure of quite clearly extraordinary brilliance. He managed to get out of a very, uh, you know, he wasn't allowed to drink from the same pitcher in his village school. The family moved to urban India and then he was sponsored to go and he came to Columbia, did a PhD here. Very influenced by John Dewey's work, uh, John Dewey the philosopher at Columbia. In fact, the uh, Scott Stroud, uh, a political philosopher is just about to publish a book on Ambedkar and Dewey. And then he comes to LSE where I work and, and does another PhD there. So he's a very learned man, but also uh, the annihilation of caste, one of his uh, essays, it was the heart of the democratic project. That social stratification and social justice, the achievement of social justice had to be the burden of democracy, as Pratap Mehta calls it. So that commitment to social justice was encapsulated in his insistence on the word republic. Because he said the word democracy is doing the work of verticality, of how you uh, elect your representatives, elections, and so on, the institutional forms of democracy. Whereas the word republic was really about what kind of democratic culture you're creating, what kind of relationship the horizontal relationship between citizens. Are we able to achieve fraternity? Are we able to achieve solidarity with people we are not related to? Are we able not to discriminate on the basis of caste, age, gender, class, etc.? That is what the word fraternity in India's constitution is trying to achieve. So it's really the pithy summary of this is to say that, you know, and I say that you can't really assess uh, or India is unable to achieve democracy both in that political and social form unless there is a republic. Without a republic, you can't have a democracy. And this is the, the sort of bringing together of the temporalities of elections and inter-electoral temporalities. And therefore, the ethnographic method, again, becomes critical to it because you're there all the time. You don't leave when the journalists leave. And, um, and you're there when nothing is happening to see what democratic culture is about. So cultivating democracy, therefore, is a monograph that, that does this analysis of democracy on the basis of uh, judging both its institutions as well as its culture. Now, the basic argument of the book, and this is not a stage sari, by the way. This is how women dry their saris. You know, it takes about 15 minutes to dry a sari like this when it's 50 degrees centigrade outside. So it's very quick laundry. Uh, but I managed to, isn't it a lovely image? It's, I mean, this is, this is village life. It's not glamorous in any way, but you do get these amazing uh, colors with the bamboo in the back and the haystacks and, and this red and green sari. Um, the basic argument is, uh, you know, it villages, again, from the Constitution, were always seen to be the receivers of ideas. You never gave them, there was no real federalism in India. You did not allow local government to form laws or collect taxes. There was, there was deep suspicion of villages, partly because of Ambedkar's own horrible experience uh, of being uh, ostracized against as a child in a village. And so villages were forever uh, uh, you know, uh, deemed to be these dens of vice, as he called them. And I kind of 
challenge that on the basis of what we find. Because here, I'm arguing that studying a village and understanding democracy from a village, as I was saying, actually shows that it creates ideas that are very good for political theory. Villages are not just recipients of political theory created in the lofty uh, halls of intellect in the center, but that villages themselves have the capacity to create values that are very good for democratic culture, completely turning this whole thing upside down. And this idea of democratic values, I use Charles Taylor's term social imaginaries because it's a very good one to think with. And let me, this is really to give you a, uh, this is, you know, it's like a trailer of the book. So uh, you will then rush out and say, gosh, I have to read the rest of it. Um, I, I can't do quite the right voice for it, but I'm sure it, you can imagine it. So what I do in the book, you know, I have 15 years and more of field notes. So how do you, how do you use that to, to convey what I'm trying to say? And I do that by choosing four key events. In classic anthropology style, they are drawn from kinship, economy, religion, and politics. And from each of these realms, I show how interconnected life is, because it is interconnected. It's the same uh, actors in each of them. I choose what I call event. These are moments, these are social dramas where stuff happens, and it's they are moments of potentialities when, you know, when, I mean, you may all recognize this, that, oh, say, you never go to a church, but your friend gets married, or your favorite aunt gets married, and you go to a church. And then you sit in church, and there's something incredibly moving about a service like that, right? Or, or a wedding anywhere. Or you think, oh, I don't believe in marriage. And then you go along to a friend's wedding, and you think, gosh, that was actually rather lovely. And something shifts, you know, so you, you have to think at that point, am I still committed to not believing in marriage or am I changing my mind or isn't that rather lovely and so on. So there are these moments of social drama as they're called in anthropology, where, uh, apropos Victor Turner's work uh, amongst the Ndembu, uh, where we think about ritual in very specific technological ways. There are technologies of these social dramas that create certain heightened states of um, imagination and awareness. And I pick four of these. One, the first one was a scandal that was, uh, you know, a scandal was not the fact that these two young people had an affair and the girl got pregnant. The f scandal was caused by this all-powerful local comrade of the Communist Party who insisted they got married. And it was a scandal because in, according to Islamic law, it was a completely haram, it was a no-no that you married matrikin of different generations. That, that wasn't allowed. So he'd crossed a red line, the comrade, who everybody hated, but could do nothing about because he was so fearsome. But when he crossed this red line, people said enough is enough. And they began to find ways to work with people. They'd never worked with people. They learned how to be political, basically, and form alliances. The second event is of a harvest, and, and, and I look at a paddy harvest to show how, uh, even though our anthropology of village India is so riven by analysis of caste, a harvest is a moment where it is a kind of activity that nobody has ever can bring in a harvest alone, without machines. I mean, we're not talking about mechanized harvesting here. People are cutting the crop themselves. And it is impossible for one person to, it is by definition a collective task. And so what that does in suppressing certain social divisions to create cooperative effort is what is created. So in each of these events, the social imaginaries that are created are the ones that I'm teasing out. You know, so you're learning to cooperate in, in a harvest. In an animal sacrifice, oh, let me show you the harvest photos. So, each of the events, I go through them like this to show that each of them create these social imaginaries of agonisms, of ca common good, of solidarity, of redistribution, and so on. And each this event produces these social imaginaries which are actually essential 
for democratic values, for, for democratic culture to flourish. So it doesn't matter whether it is a religious ritual or a secular moment, it's creating, it has the potential to create these ideas that are necessary. And these values, and this is to go back to the title of this talk, that cultivation as practice and metaphor, what I mean by that is that these values, you know, whether, say, the need to cooperate with people you don't like. If I said, um, okay, we've just been told we've got to empty this room in the next five minutes. No one person can do this, right? We'd all have to do, to do it together. At that point, you can't say, oh, I'm not going to pick up her plate because I don't like her, or she was rude to my boyfriend yesterday. You know, at that point, you just do it because you learn to suppress self-interest in, for the purpose of common good. And it is these values, though, are not values that are produced and are permanent. They need to be constantly cultivated. So if you want to be a good citizen, or if you want to be somebody who's known to be helpful, say, it is not something, you can't do it once and forget about it. You have to continually perform it. In the same way, and I say that this practice of cultivation is one quite literally, it is practice of a farmer. A farmer knows that there are no easy wins. You don't plant a seed and then come back six months later to collect the harvest. You have to be in that field every single day, whatever the weather. It doesn't matter whether you have a headache or whether it's cold, you just get out there because every day something might happen to your crop. And any of us, even just growing a potted plant on your windowsill, you know this to be the case, right? If you forget to look after it for 10 days, oops, it's going to die. And this is what I think we need for to stop democratic backsliding. Democracy is exactly that kind of thing which we think you can introduce to countries and societies by setting up certain institutional structures. But as the last decade has shown all over the world, that if you get complacent that, oh, we are a democracy in America, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we have a fantastic constitution, we are the mother of all democracies, and you don't watch out, you don't cultivate, you're not vigilant, lo and behold, suddenly there are armies of people marching on Capitol Hill. How the hell did that happen? So the opposite of cultivation is complacency. Because you sit back and think, of course I live in a democracy. You don't need to do anything more about it. It is what happens in between elections that is going to make sure that it continues to be a democracy afterwards. So that's why cultivation for me is a combination of those two, uh, those two temporalities. So I think I'm going to stop there, and I just, I'm just going to leave the con conclusions up there. It's nothing new. It's it's um, it's just a summary of what I've just said. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm very happy to take any questions from anyone. Um, interesting how you describe the concept the concept of like an election line being where like the the sort of inequalities that normally permeate everyday life being suspended and so I was wondering like do you like then do you kind of see that that particular moment as like republic working and then like the rest of life being like republic working but kind of more imperfectly and as long as that sanctity is preserved you see like reliance or or faith in elections continuing and then also do you see that faith and uh, functioning of republic being tested as like political outcomes vary. So for example, as the Communist Party lost that one election, I don't know if they regained power afterwards. Like, did you see faith shifting or turning there? And how, that, how did that affect your analysis of Republic? OK, thank you. That's, that's such a pithy summary of what I was saying. Yes, exactly. That is the moment of the Republic working. That's exactly what it is. And it needs to be preserved. And you know, elections are under assault by the current uh, government in India at the moment, it's been distorting, it's been distorted in three key ways. I talk about it in the book, you can read about it later. 
But it is important to preserve the integrity of elections because it is a symbol of the republic, exactly. Who people vote for is a related issue, but not the same issue. You know, so it's not about, but it is true that one, you know, people, a lot of people wonder why the communists won elections for 34 years in a row, I mean, uninterrupted for 34 years. And my explanation, you know, and the communists by the end, were, they hadn't brought in any new reforms. They were, you know, completely hubristic in being bloated with power, et cetera. You know, all the things that happened with continuous power. But the one thing they were rewarded for was the fact that they brought dignity to manual work. They raised daily wages, and that daily wage didn't, you know, didn't rise with inflation as it should have done. So it was an incomplete project. But the fact that you could no longer keep people waiting for their wages, the fact that low caste people didn't have to get off their cycles when they were cycling past upper caste people, or being chided for wearing trousers, or being above themselves, basically, that discourse disappeared. And that was really the communist legacy, which they were rewarded for. So in a sense, political parties that bring that Republican fraternity you know, in is, is, is a big deal. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, professors. Thank you for coming. Um, so my question is about if you would kind of imagine the same democratic values or social imaginaries um, can be cultivated in non-democratic but agrarian societies or villages. For example, can the same values be cultivated in a Chinese village? And what kind of implications would that bring about for that sort of um, yeah. yeah political society? Yeah, I, no, thank you. That's, that's such an interesting question. And I think you're right. You can flip it and say that can you have, what you're saying is can you have democratic culture without democratic institutions? Mm -hmm. Right? Which, which the answer is yes. And I think the, the protests in Shanghai last year, where were they coming from? Because no institution in China, I mean, or every institution in China is set up to precisely curb that kind of protest. And yet it happens. So, and that's a perfect vindication that you can have a sense of solidarity. I mean, that's what it was. It wasn't even, you know, it was anger against the government, but it was also a recognition that people who were protesting were not necessarily linked to each other in any ways. They were just collective sufferance at COVID policy. Right? And that was the basis for which people felt a solidarity with each other, even though they may have come from completely different class and different backgrounds. They were able to see that as a solidarity. And again, you know, the, the thinking about social movements is always so interesting because once you're able to come together in social movements, you're, that feeds into making the solidarity even greater. So the sustained nature of that protest was also startling. And so, so that, you know, the brief answer is yes, and, and the longer answer is also yes, I think. So. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Adarsh, I'm a junior. Um, I have two sort of related questions, if you don't mind. My first question is, I know voting in India has historically been like very group-based, right? Like people vote based on their caste, based on their religion, which was very against how the idea of voting in a liberal democracy first came about. Um, so my question is, based on your research, although voting is sacrosanct to these villagers, to what extent was their voting based on them feeling power as an individual agent, as opposed to feeling like they were part of just like a collective, like maybe, you know, being Muslims and they were just exerting, uh, you know, trying to be conformed to what their group supposed, is supposed to do. Um, and my second question is actually, so I know the CAA and RC protests, like those were called a big revitalization of democracy at the local level, but um, most of, the coverage of the protests focused on big cities like Shaheen Bagh. So I'm wondering to what extent that trickled down to the village level, especially in a place like West Bengal where the effects were said to be the largest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, meaty questions, both of them. Um, the first one of who people vote, you know, the relationship between why they vote and who they vote for. That's what you're pushing at. 
Um, the premise of your question is wrong. People never, you know, you may think liberal democracy is about an autonomous voter, but the empirical evidence doesn't show that, right? The, if you are going to, I mean, in, in the United States, for instance, if you're gonna have two parties, that's it, two parties for this huge country, and your identity is predetermined. I mean, I found it astonishing when I learned this for the first time that you're registered as a Democrat, you're registered as a Republican. You know, so there is no, you, you are pre-committed to being a certain kind of voter. So the idea that you are going to weigh the pros and cons and look at a manifesto and make an informed decision as an autonomous voter, unhampered and unhindered by social forces and your community. Sorry, where is this happening? <laughs> Right? It's the theory. So let's look at what actually happens. How do people work when they are voting? And yes, there are a number of, you know, as we saw, for instance, in Great Britain with the Brexit referendum, it was very interesting. It was a referendum, so not quite democratic elections, but it was very interesting that anyone with a university degree seemed to vote against Brexit. They didn't think it was a good idea to leave Europe. So there are different kinds of communities you can belong to. Because you mentioned the Muslim, and because most of my informants, my friends, our interlocutors are Muslim, it maddens me no end that endless pieces are written about the Muslim vote in India, like it's a herd of sheep. Muslims have four castes. There are class, there are landowners, there are sharecroppers, there are agricultural workers. They all vote differently. So yes, interests are formed on the basis of group interests, but that it is determined by religion or caste always is, yes, there is a democratic, you know, the third democratic upsurge, the democratization of democracy, the formation of caste-based parties, what happens in UP, but that is one story. It is not the whole story. So I think we have to probe the reason why people vote and whether they are choosing to vote. So, you know, in, in my, I mean, actually, the very interesting question in all those years that the left front won for 34 years, the Congress, which was the main opposition party, continued to get 40% of the vote share. Who were those people, you know? And there were people from drawn from the same communities, the same, but they were people who clearly did not want to vote for the left front. And they knew that their Congress was never going to win, but there was no way they were going to vote for anyone else because they wanted to vote for the party they wanted to vote for. So when, pe when Trinamool Congress comes out, you know, people say, oh, where the hell did it come out of nowhere? No, it wasn't nowhere. It was there in the secret ballot. It's there in the vote shares if you look at the, um, the, uh, the, the figures for it. So there are multiple uh, factors at play. What was the second question again? Uh, about CAA and RC. Yeah. Yeah. No, CAA and RC, you know, the, uh, the story, as, as Professor Panda was saying to me last night, that you know, anyone who knows West Bengal, uh, CANRC in West Bengal will be a very different story to say what it is in Assam or what it may, you know, what it may look to Muslim communities elsewhere in India. West Bengal is a different. It was also just, it was not, it was a very urban phenomenon. It was determined. Muslims in villages don't go on demonstrations. Demonstration, I mean, it's interesting. I never really thought about this. They go to political rallies. But the idea of a demonstration is an urban phenomenon. It requires urban spaces. So demos is not what uh, villagers go on. So, um, but when I went back in 2019, no, I have, no, when I went back after, you know, they were not, I mean, it wasn't at all uh, top of their minds at all. They were not bothered by it in Bengal in the same way. So every part of India is different and, you know, Bengal is, 25% is Muslim in Bengal, so it's a different story. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Gosh, we have a queue. Okay, I'm going to, and we have three minutes, what, five minutes. All right, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your talk and for coming here to speak to us. I found it really insightful and intriguing to hear uh, about your book and your thoughts. And the f my question has kind of been alluded to by the previous, uh, mm -hmm. you know, questioner, but I'll try and reframe it and phrase it differently. Um, I was interested in the shift of power that you talked about that happened when the Communist Party was voted out after 34 years in power. And I was curious that did you feel uh, that the 
shifts that happened. And you mentioned in your book that I think in 2019 or 2021, now there was a shift towards the BJP as well in that area. Yeah. Do these shifts happen on the basis of some kind of uh, policy interest that you know people mobilize over and feel that you know their say political interests have been neglected and uh, arise to you know create a political shift through that? Or you know I think as the previous questioner asked, are a lot of political ties ki or political allegiances kind of based on non-political issues such as family relationships or personal ties? And uh, religious symbolism and any other such, you know, uh, mm. symbolism and uh, ties that can be established. Thank you. It's uh, the I was we were just having this conversation, Asima and I, earlier that one of the explanations for the BJP's rise in West Bengal. I mean, there's a caste story to be told, uh, and the mobilisation of lower castes of a particular kind. But in my village of Madanpur and Chishti, in my research village, um, it was a generational story. You know, so it was, it was about interest, but it was in the same family. The father was a really committed comrade, you know, a cadre member of the left front, uh, of the Communist Party, of the Farmers Union. But the young sons who felt completely polarized between, you know, all the families being either left front or Trinamool, felt the BJP was theirs. It was their politics, and they were going to go out on their motorcycles. You know, the face of the BJP in West Bengal was young men on motorcycles shouting Jai Shri Ram. So it tapped into a certain demography of a disenfranchised, unemployed young male who felt that they didn't have a political party that they could call their own that was distinct from their fathers, as, as we know, young men always have this tension with their fathers. That, so it actually goes against this family ties argument and, and shows that it can be a generational story as well. Thank you. Final question. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I had two questions, actually. Uh, one is that India is uh, officially a democracy which can sometimes be a questionable statement. I mean, the BBC went as far as calling it an elective autocracy. I wanted to hear your opinion on where you think, how would you define India, essentially? That's my first question. And the second question is, uh, do you feel that a high-functioning democracy, for India, being a high-functioning democracy is a good thing? Or do you think, in the balance of power, a, a stronger sense of government control for a, a country as huge as India might be beneficial. Okay, so um, the, the two are related, of course. I think what is my prognosis, oh no, okay, what's my uh, uh, assessment of Indian democracy at the moment? It's not very different from, from what has been said about backsliding, and I think India, my only addition to that debate is there's been such controversy over these international indicators, right? Whether it is VDEM or whether it's Freedom I Index or, you know, and the press freedom is 150 out of 180. Um, and there is pushback from the Indian government that, you know, who's the West to tell us who we are and, you know, how dare they, and this kind of chauvinistic pushback. And my response to that is, no, exactly. Why should we rely, forget other indicators. India should compare its own performance as a democracy to its own record. 10 years ago, what was the state of democratic institutions? What was the state of democratic culture? 20 years ago, what was it? 30 years ago, what was it? Are we getting better? Because, it's, I mean, forget, if no one was measuring this, one would still be concerned about this, right? That are you making a better democracy? Because as Charles Taylor says, you know, democracy is a tea league project. It is, it's always becoming. It's not something that finishes. It always is hap in the making. So if that is the case, then presumably it's always becoming better. And if we were to think of just elections and how, you know, there was a peak point with session overhauling Election Commission of India, it became this very prominent body. And since then, elections just got better and better and better that by 2009 when we were doing this study, I mean, the, 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 you know, the surveys were showing it was the most respected public institution, the public, you could talk to election officials anywhere in the country and they had a sense of commitment and 
so on and so forth. So if you look at Onichani's work on the first elections of 1951 and 2009, there was definitely an improvement. I'm sorry, I can't say that since, since then. It has slid, and I show in my preface, in fact, uh, the reasons why I think that has been corrupted. About does a diverse country, see, India's democratic project also had a commitment to its diversity and to development, and to the last man in that queue, you know, that Gandhian idea that are you doing something that is helping the poorest, then you're on the right path. That, was the f that is the imagination of India's constitution, you know, when it decides to be a democracy, that's why. It's not a United States of India, it's a union of states. It's a federal entity. So to talk of a strong center as if you can send out diktats from Delhi and make stuff happen simply just doesn't work in India. The way it is set up, that's not how it's designed. So talking of a strong center beyond a point does not make sense. But what we have seen is a gradual centralizing of power to the extent that it's not even just the capital, it is the prime minister's office that has become the only place where decisions are taken. And that is, I mean, that is authoritarian, and that can never be, you know, and that's why you then see budgets, where in a country like India, the outlay for education and health is going down every year. This is what happens when you centralize. I mean, no state government would want to do this, though they're state subjects, and they'll say, oh, well, you can do what you want with the states. But with the GST, which was meant to be a progressive thing, you have now made it fiscally central as well. So fiscal federalism, whatever little there was, has disappeared. So the state finance commissions have disappeared. The Finance Commission of India becomes the dispersing body, and states have to negotiate that. So again, the dispersal of funds is, is centrally con uh, controlled. So you're not, you're not allowing, and, and, and then, you know, I've just, as it happened, I made a trip in December, I made a trip in January, and I traveled, you know, from Rajasthan to Meghalaya, north, south, everywhere, I happened to go for work. Everywhere, the public sphere is plastered with posters of the prime minister. You can do that with a lot of money and a central, and a strong central. Whether those posters actually you can get into subliminally into people's minds, is that governance? I'm not sure. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Those were really terrific questions. Thank you very much.